Some of you would stand with me. We're going to get the man of God on the floor. I believe he's got a word for us tonight. Amen. So thankful that Brother and Sister Corsi and Braden is with us and will be with us for the weekend. We love and appreciate these folks very, very much. A man that is called of God, a man that's anointed of God. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, the good anointed word of God tonight. Can we just lift our hands together one more time and let's love the Lord as the preacher comes to the pulpit. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift you up in this place. We magnify you. We glorify you. We exalt you. Hallelujah. Let your will be done in this house. We didn't come to be seen. We didn't come to entertain, but we come to magnify and glorify the name of Jesus. Amen. If it's applicable and feasible, why don't you reach over and lay hands on somebody right now. Pray for your neighbor and just pray that God will bless them and that they'll receive tonight something that will encourage and strengthen them. In the name, in the name, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I believe it. Lord, I believe it. Lord, I believe it. We're going to leave here different than what we came. In the name, in the name of Jesus. Oh, if you've been repented and been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, let's praise him right now. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're born again? Amen. This is actually an old song. Amen. Worship with us as we sing. In my house, there's been a mercy killing. You see, the man I used to be, he had to die. And the death of that man was a final way of revealing. In a spiritual way to live, I had to die. Now, if I let that dead man linger in me, the church, I might get a little idle in my way. So, down to the celebration river, I'm gonna bury that dead man in a grave. I'm going down to and I'm gonna be buried alive and I'm gonna show my heavenly father that the man I used to be he finally died said I'm going I'm going down to River, yes, I am, Lord, and I'm gonna be buried alive, and I'm gonna show my heavenly father that the man I used to be, he finally died. See, when I think of where I'm going uh, compared to where I've been, uh, the church, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, that I've been born again. Uh, when I think of where I'm going uh, in terms of where I've been, Lord, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, that I've been born again. I'm going down going down uh, to the river Lord I'm gonna be back in the name of Jesus yes Jesus I gotta show gotta show uh, my heavenly father uh, that the man I used to be he finally died I like this somebody testify when I think of where I'm going in terms of where I've been, Lord, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, that I've been born again. Hey, when I think of where I'm going, in terms of where I've been, Lord, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, that I've been born again. I'm going down. I'm going down to the river. And I'm going to be buried, buried alive. See, I want to show, oh, my heavenly Father, that the man I used to be, he finally died. 
How many you know God brought you from somewhere? It's hard for what it used to be. You're not that anymore. And that's why I like this bridge. Think about where you go compared to where you used to be. Oh, when I think of where I'm going in terms of where I've been, Lord, it makes me glad to know my Lord that I've been born again. I said when I think of where I'm going in terms of where I've been, Lord, makes me glad to know my Lord that I've been born again. I'm going down, down to the river. I'm going to be buried, be buried alive. Because I want to show, I'm going to show my heavenly Father that the man I used to be, he finally died. Said I want to show my heavenly Father that the man I used to be finally died. Oh, aren't you glad you're not what you used to be? Aren't you glad all things have passed away? Hallelujah. Oh, let's take some time and love him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I can't help it. I like that part. When I think of where I'm going, in terms of where I've been, Lord, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, I've been born again. Think about it. When I think of where I'm going, in terms of where I've been, Lord, makes me glad to know my Lord. Hey, I've been born again. I'm going down, down to the river. Yes, I am. I'm going to be buried alive because I want to show my heavenly Father that the man I used to be has finally died. Oh, let's love him again. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know about you, but I come to have church. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad I've been born again. I'm glad. Jesus is. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have a Bible, we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to do something tonight. I don't like it when preachers do this, but I'm going to go to another book also. So if you have trouble finding both places, one of them will be on the screen, I'm sure. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 20 which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism. Somebody shout baptism. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. It does what? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, we don't give you a bar of soap so you can go scrub a dub dub in the tub. That's not what we're doing. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for just a few moments, going over to 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Now, that's not a cut down. That means. You need to know this. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. For a moment, I want to talk to you about what we just sang about a water grave. Let's pray. Lord, anoint the word, ears to hear, and hearts that receive. 
I am definitely not the preacher you are. Without you, we can do nothing. But with you, God, we can accomplish whatever it is that you want to do in this place tonight. I believe, God, you want to touch a soul. You want to change a life. I bind every enemy, every hindrance in Jesus' name. Let your will be done in Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. As you're seated, let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Glory. Glory. Well, in case you can be seated, in case you don't know it, when you repented, you ticked off every devil known to man. When you accepted the challenge to come down to an altar or kneel wherever you were, a prison, a bathroom, a nursing home, a backyard, you upset every hair-lipped devil that man could ever imagine. He got mad. Why? Because when you repent, first of all, we all do what we all do. We say we're sorry, and that's good. But that's not what makes him mad. You declare, I don't want to be this one. Now, let me tell you something. If there's one thing the devil hates, and I'm going to lay it on your heart. If there's one thing the devil hates, that's change. And the devil's got you convinced that you can't change. But I have to tell somebody that there's a God that can take the most changeable and change them in the time. Maybe you're not hearing me, but I'm a God. get up I repented it's hard for some people to repent I've been talking to people that haven't done it yet because it's hard they want to but they haven't because it's hard some people go down and repent like it's just another trip at the dollar store because they're not really repenting when a preacher's quiet like this it means sila. If you're coming down here all the time for the same old garbage, you're not repenting. You're just saying, sorry. Sorry, don't bust my butt. Sorry. I'm tired of preacher preaching to me. Sorry. And then we give a little whoopee. And we've all memorized the tongue phrase, Sika Mahama Hama Hama. I know I am because I got quiet. Some of you think you've had it, but you haven't. But when you really repent, you get up and you're like, whoa. I feel like there's hope. I feel like there's really hope. I feel like I can't beat this alcohol. I feel like I can't shake these drugs. I feel like my home can't come back together. I feel like, and I'm just going to throw some stuff out here. If it lands, it lands. If it don't, it don't. I feel like I don't have to smack my wife anymore. I feel like I can't get a job and provide for my family now. I don't need meth anymore. I don't need what Hollywood told me anymore. I don't need to cheat anymore. I feel like something just changed in me, and I don't need those things that I thought I and that's going to last for a while. Let me give you some information here. All you did was make them mad. You didn't deal with them. You got so hyped up and you got so excited. Every devil around you is like, whoa. All right. Just back up. What do you mean back up? As soon as the shine wears off, they're going to go back to the bar. As soon as that Sunday night, whatever it is, wears off, they're going to get on the phone and call their girlfriend. Just back off. But you know what happens? Whenever they tempt you to do it, you're like, no. I'm not going back there anymore. I'm not doing those things anymore. I'm not acting like that anymore. But yet they still come and they're pounding you. And you run up to your pastor, you're like, what's the matter? And the pastor says, well, do you know what the other two steps are? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, in the name, in the name of Jesus. Why is that important? 
thank you for asking. Paul said, you're just like Moses in the Red Sea. You can understand something. That devil But when Moses Threatening to kill, but when the rain stopped, you, you, you want to not you get the water and you go down in the name of Jesus. When you get into that baptismal tank, that creek, that creek, that river, whatever you want to call it, you got to understand them devils are right on your heels. They're right there. They're going to follow you into that water and they're going to say, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. But as you go down, your pastor baptizing you is going to be like Noah. Just hang on. When you come back up, you're going into the ark. And everything is going to be all right. When you come out of that water, then you can say, All things have passed away, and behold, all, all things have become new. All things. When it came down to Noah, all flesh, everybody say, All flesh. All flesh died that moved upon the earth. If it walked, if it crawled, if it flew, it died. The water killed it. But the only ones that didn't were the eight that were in the ark. Every soldier of Pharaoh, every imp that Pharaoh had that rode his mighty chariot into that departed water, when it came down and went back to normal, they died. And when they got to the other side in the 15th chapter of Exodus, they started singing that our God is a warrior. Our God is a fighter. I come to tell you, if you want to fight in your battles, go down in the name of Jesus. You devil he don't like water and I'm going to show you Bible for this because it's a reminder of things to come when they came to Jesus and they started pressing him on what he did and who he was bring up Luke chapter 20 I mean Luke 11 verse 20 Take this little by little. I love this. But if I with the finger, whose finger? The finger of God cast out devils. Jesus is saying, me getting the devil out of your house is as easy as me doing this. You think it's great, me casting out devils? That's all I did. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is upon you. Next verse. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Verse 22. But when a stronger, somebody shout stronger. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he, verse 23, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. The strong man was the devil. Because the devil had no idea what was happening in that manger. Because every time the devils would interact with Jesus, they say, have you come to torment us before our time? What's this? What are you doing? They know they've got a day of reckoning coming. And they kind of just sat around and said, well, until that day comes, we're just going to have us some fun on this planet as long as we can. 
But then this little baby grows up to be a carpenter who later on gets baptized, who later on starts going out and doing these great things, and they're confused. And they realize somebody stronger than us is here. And now they're really confused because in the time of Jesus' day, it was just him. But now there's churches all over the People repent and being baptized and receiving the Holy Stand. Every time you get baptized, that's practically an exorcism taking place. That's God kicking the devil out, saying you do not be locked here anymore. Jesus was showing us with every exorcism, Jesus was giving us just a hint of one day what he's going to do on the earth when he officially kicks that rascal out of here. Because they took him as they cast him out. We don't in this area. We don't this town. We don't this community. We don't Can you can you bring that latter part of that verse up, the last uh, last part of twenty two of Luke eleven? Notice what he says: "Taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. Everything the devil uses, God's just taking it from him." What is this? Jack Daniels. Really? They won't live without it. Raise your hand if you've lived without it. What is this stuff? Cocaine. Methamphetamines. All them other cute little words. Really? Yeah. Flushes it. They won't live without it. Raise your hand if you've lived without it. Huh? What is this? Oh, this is a bunch of women on the side. He can't live without them women. Really? Raise your hand if since God got a you a man of huh? what's on this screen that's called pornography he will not live without that really <laughs> might be some fewer hands now if you've been living because what he does is he takes every weapon the devil has and he holds it up in his face and says everything you got is a failure it's a lie meant to not last but when I get a hold of somebody it's from that day until eternity I can't I can't quit I can't shake this I just can't I can't get the victory you need to be baptized you need to be baptized why is it everybody in that church has got peace and I don't because they got in the ark you need to get in the ark why is everybody in that church is shaking those things away and I haven't because you need to do just what the Bible says you must be born again if I ever pastor again I want to create a ceremony for baptism that captures what these two writers wrote about I want the person being baptized to see what's chasing them. And I mean, it's right on. How close was Pharaoh? A cloud. A cloud separated him from Israel. A cloud. And then I want to create a scenario to where when they get into that water, and they step in. They see a, a pastor there who's like, now you're going under. And explains everything he needs to explain. But when you come up, I'm pulling you into the ark of safety. And this church is going to make a sound. And when we make a sound, that's the door shutting behind you. And that means you ain't leaving. You're here. What's that old hymn say? There's an old 
hope of Zion. There is something being made. There is something being constructed. And if you want to be a part of it, you need to repent and you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. It's more than getting wet. It's more than having a ceremony. It is a spiritual statement. To it says you have control over me. The devil. He don't, he don't like water. Let's go to Luke eleven twenty four. When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through what's that? Dry places. He don't go to wet places. He goes to dry places. When you get into the Old Testament, I'm going to touch on something here. That Sunday morning we're going to come back and talk about the underworld, how the pagans in the Bible deal with it. And what really happened, I believe, when Jesus was gone for three days after his death. But when these demons leave all through the Old Testament, they're called goats. They're called satyrs. They're called these animals, weird-looking animals. And they dwell in deserts. And even in the book of Revelation, you hear about these spirits that sound like big birds of fowl and things like that. And they dwell in dry, dry places. Why? Because it has been believed thousands of years before there ever was a Christianity. Going back into the Sumerian culture, Mesopotamian region, going back even before the days of Abraham. From what they began to interpret from their religious writings, they believe that it was from the very, that when you died, you had to go through the very depth of the ocean and you entered the underworld that way. That's silly. Ain't no Bible for that. I'm glad you asked that. Let's go to the book of Jonah. Chapter 2, verse 6. I got lazy and didn't write them down. So as soon as it comes up here, we'll read it. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6. Jonah is inside this big, great fish. He says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. Notice, where's he at? He's in the ocean. He's in the water. He says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars, you can substitute that for gates, was about me forever. Yet hast Thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. This is something that they truly, truly believe. Not only when you die did you get put in the earth, pagans, a lot of pagans believe we had a soul. Plato, the philosopher, writes about the soul a lot. And they believed it had to go way down into the depths. Now, here's the funny thing. When the Bible gets started... What's the one thing that's there that Genesis never told us God created? The water. And Jeremiah talks in the same Hebrew language. It's only used in Genesis and in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says when God gets done destroying this place, it's going to be without form. It's going to be without this. It's going to be without that. And it sounds just like the beginning of Genesis. It was a desolate, it was a nasty, chaotic place. In the Bible, water represents chaos. That's why when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they were like, that's where Leviathan is. That's where the monsters are. That's where when we fall out of our boats, we die. Those storms crash our boats. It's like the water has a mind of its own. Who can control it? Read the dialogue in Job. God's like, can you play with Leviathan? Can you go down into the depths? Not even the devils want to go there because they know what that represents. That represents our end. And that's why God says the second step to you getting better, you're going to walk into the water. It's more than just a ritual. It's more than just a ceremony. It's a sign to the devil devil you lose you lose and one day you're really gonna lose the bottoms of the mountains the gates of the netherworld that's where it all was he said you are gonna get 
into the water, and you're going to be, and I like how they say this, buried. We don't sprinkle. You don't, do you? We don't (laughs) sprinkle. I almost got fired right there. That Sunday night I was preaching. Lucky I didn't get fired there a few times. I told the church, I said, I feel like JFK and going through the tunnel. And when it happens, it will not be a lone gunman. You can feel eyeballs. And that was, I was at the home church. Well, if anybody's watching, God bless you. Get in the water and get buried. Why? Because that just reminds the devil where he's going. And whenever he was casting legion out, when you get into the gospel of Mark, he doesn't say, oh, I want to stay in this guy. That's not what he says. He says, I want to stay in the area. They're territorial. There are devils that don't want to leave Elizabeth. They don't. There's devils that don't want to leave Parkersburg. There's devils that don't want to leave your house. We don't want to leave the area. So, uh, but here's the thing. They don't like living outside of stuff. Because if he had just said we want to stay in the area, it might have been cool. It goes like this. Uh, can we have those pigs? May we have those piggies? The Bible says there's 2,000 or more pigs there. And Jesus says, go. What did the pigs do? Sometimes I hope we're smarter than a pig. The pigs are like, whoink! Wilbur! What, Clyde? Something's in me. Let's get to the water. I saw that baptizer in town. He said, we need to repent and be baptized. Let's get the water, Clyde! Can you imagine you're that devil in there going, no! 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 Oh, man! Because when you read Revelation, where do a lot of these critters that are big, bad, and ugly come from? The Bible says the abyss. And when you read about Noah's Ark, and I realize if I'm not going far here because it's a very hazy topic. When you read about Noah's Ark and you get into the book of Jude, you get into Genesis, there may have been a lot more going on with Noah than we'll ever, ever truly know. And God may have buried more in that water than we'll ever know. And that might be what Jude says. There are spirits locked up in deep darkness, and they will not see the light of day until judgment. And all them devils know that's where they are. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And that's why now, how they do it, they're so slick. Now they got preachers telling you, honey, you don't got to be baptized. All you got to do is come down here and shake my hand and say that I've confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And you saved, baby, you saved. Dr. Greg Habermas, who's about to retire, he's the greatest, greatest guy to present facts on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's argued with people all over the world, and it's hard to prove him wrong. He has an argument that Christ rose that is tremendous. I went and heard this guy face to face, and it was all I could do not to jump up and run around that building because when he talks about how real the resurrection is and how there's so much evidence for it, it'll make the hair that you don't have on your head stand up. He teaches at Liberty University. He's, he's, on, he's getting ready to die, and he's putting all of his notes into a gigantic book, and I hope to God I get to buy that one day. He's, he's a great guy, but I was listening to him during the pandemic. You know, there's a lot of junk on YouTube, but some people are starting to put good stuff up there. And I was listening to him during the pandemic, and he's going through the creeds. Now, this guy's a Trinitarian. Liberty University, and Liberty's not what it used to be, if you know what I'm saying. Liberty University. And he gets to that verse in Romans where he says, you know, I'll confess with the Lord Jesus Christ your mouth, you shall be saved. He said, you got to realize, people, that's what they used to have them say in the water. He said that was their baptismal creed in the water. I jumped up. I hit rewind. 
did he say what I think he said? And that's what the devil's done. The devil's taken the good book and twisted it and got some slick people up telling you, you don't need this, you don't need tongues, you don't need Jesus' name baptism, you don't need holiness, but this preacher come to tell you there's only one thing that truly scares the devil, and that's when you go down in the name of Jesus. So what Dr. Habermas meant was some of you were baptized. You probably got in the water. A preacher gave you a handkerchief if he liked you. If not, he just said, deal with it. <laughs> uh, and hopefully I dementia don't hit while I'm holding you under. <laughs> so he gave you in the water, and he probably said something, you know, about it. Confess your faith and forgive us your sins, things of that. He said something like that. Dr. Habermas said that's what they said before they baptized you. And now the devil's twisted that and said, you don't need baptism. You just need that little word that you said. I come to tell somebody right now, if you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. Because the devil don't like it. When you get into Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, there's... It's laid out, I've already touched on it, it said, Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of God, art thou hither to torment us before the time? That's what they were wanting to know. We, we, we know that, that one day our judgment's coming. Why are you here? Why are you doing this now? And the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that the church is going to teach the principalities and, the, and the things in the air. The church teaches them. And the Bible says angels long to look into this. This thing came in a disguise. This thing came in undercover. And once it started working, it took hell by storm. It took hell by surprise. And hell still can't believe that people are being baptized in Jesus' name. But I can't. Can. Why? Because there's things the devil's got that no pill can set you free from, that no shrink can set you free from, that marriage can't set you free from, that love alone can't set you free from. You have got to come to God and repent and be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. The arrival of Jesus seemed like an illegitimate change to God's play for their time of judgment. Baptism equals exorcism, and it's a preview of eschatology. It's a preview of last things. They, hey, we thought we had plenty of time. You don't. And now just like we don't know when the day is, the devil now knows that he don't know when the day is. He's playing well, just like we are blind. But the difference is we got a relationship with God, and he's on our side and when the story ends we win can you just imagine the board meeting in hell what just happened well your darkness he walks into town took our subject who was breaking chains, living naked, scaring everybody like a booger man. One of our greatest assets. And all he did was look at him. And we could not stop him from going and worshiping that man. Didn't we have a legion in there? We're talking hundreds of thousands. Didn't we have a legion in there? Yes, yes, your unholiness. We did. And you could not stop him from going to, to, to Jesus? Nope. Now, we've heard that there's power, you know, in his name. So we even said, hey, Jesus, we adjure you in your name. Don't touch this. Well, why did he touch it? Because the guy wanted to be free. You mean it's set up now to where no matter how many demons we got in somebody, all they got to have is the want to, and they can be free? Apparently. We're our legion now. Well, <laughs> they went into some pigs. Bring the pigs. Well, the pigs committed suicide. In what? Water. Water. A few years later, 
after the resurrection. There's this day called Pentecost. There's another meeting. What's going on? Over 5,000 people, your ugliness, are repenting and going into water in the name of Jesus. And they're being filled with the Holy Ghost, and it seems to be happening now every day. Can we stop it? Your foulness, we are sad to say, no. We can't stop it. Therefore, what we have to do is we have to send spies in there and gain their trust and change the method. And if we do that, they will be lost. Sad to say, it has worked in a lot of cases because there's a lot of preachers that I know that don't preach this anymore, but I'm still like Joshua. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I want you to know, I want you to know this. Here's what it boils down to. Do you want to? Then you can. He even knows that there is but one God, and he trembles. Why doesn't he change? Because he don't want to. He even knows what his end is. What did the demons say? Did you come to torment us before our time? He even knows what his end is, and he don't care. Now, when you deal with people like that, you cannot let them get you down. You have to go to the next one. And sometimes those people are going to be your sons and your daughters. And they're going to look at you weeping and say, we know, we know, but we're not. We're not. And you can say, oh, I must have been a bad parent. Nope. Oh, the church must have failed them. No. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Because when you start feeling sorry for yourself and feeling sorry for the church, that's when you start compromising. You've got to believe that it works because it worked for you. And it worked for your family before you. And it worked for the ones that led you down to that altar. And there's still revivals happening all over the world. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Baptism will work then. And it works I say this in closing if you want to come. For 10 years, I went into a maximum security penitentiary. I was doing home missions. My wife and I's first home missions church, we were 18. And a pastor got a hold of me. I had a radio program. And a pastor got a hold of me and said, hey, are you on the radio in so-and-so town? I said, yeah, I am. I said, uh, we're actually hoping to do a, maybe a, a, a work there. There's no church there. He said, guess who's listening to you? Who? He said, a whole bunch of death row inmates. They asked me if I knew you. And I said, well, if that's the same Jason Corsi I know, yeah, his wife grew up. On, I was her pastor as a little girl. They said, we would like for him to come and preach. So since I lived the closest to the pen for twice a month for almost 10 years, I went down there. And I dealt with everybody I preached to was a murderer. At one time, everybody. And you want to talk about putting fear in you these guys look like when they come to church they still wanted to murder somebody but on one Monday the guards would lead us through the yard and sometimes that was fun they, they put me in this room that looked like the dungeon of a castle they actually called this prison the castle on the Cumberland and they would not leave a guard in there the chaplain wouldn't stay the chaplain didn't like it because I wasn't Trinity chaplain hated it that we didn't preach trinity so he wouldn't stay so it was just me and my wife locked into a room and all these guys do is pump iron muscles bigger than my head some of them dudes and i'm up preaching and this guy comes in ball goatee tatted muscled and he sets one or two seats behind my wife and the whole time I'm preaching, he didn't blink, and he never lost eye contact. And for the first time while I'm in this prison, I start getting nervous. The whole time I'm preaching, I'm like, what is he thinking? 
You know, he's sitting right there by my wife, and he don't look happy. What is he thinking? So we give the altar call. And wouldn't you know it, the guy that's sitting in front of him drops to his knees crying. i got to go pray for that dude. So I go, I go over and pray for him, but the way I go in, I go in where I don't make eye contact with this new guy. And I'm praying, this guy's bawling and squalling. And when I stood up, I was so excited that that guy, I think he got the Holy Ghost that day. I was so excited about it that when I stood up, I forgot Frankenstein was there. And he and I, pow! And I just froze. And he just stared at me. And I thought, well, I stuck out my hand. I will never forget this. He grabbed my hand. He jerked me in. When I hit his chest, it was like hitting a brick wall. Boom! He hugged me tight, put his lips in my ear. I'm not making this up. And he said, you remind me of my mama. Now, when you're in a prison, and the first thing a prisoner tells you you remind, just like that, you remind me of my mama. I'm like, oh, Jesus, today's the day. All the horror stories are true. He pushed back. And when I looked in his eyes, I knew I had nothing to worry about because tears. He said, I grew up in Chicago, rough side of town. He said, my mama used to wake me up every Sunday morning. Even when I was a teenager and I was already doing drugs and drinking, came in late, drunk, stoned, said she smacked me, whacked me, grabbed me by the ear, say, boy, as long as you live here, you're going to church. He said, preacher, my mama actually brought me to church by the ear sometimes. He said, if I ever cussed her, she'd backhand me and bust my mouth open. He said, I kept telling her, Mama, this ain't real. This stuff don't work. And as soon as I get some money, I'm gone. And she said, you ain't never going to get no money because you put it up your nose. Because his drug of choice, I guess, was cocaine. He said, but you know what? I went out one night, and I got stupid, and I got locked up. And they sent me down here. And my mama was old, and she couldn't come and see me. He said, but when mama would call, you know what I'd ask her to do? Talk to me like you used to, mama. Pray for me like you used to, mama. He said, preacher, mama's dead. And he said, I pray and I pray. I want to hear mama. He said, as soon as you started preaching, you became my mama. And that's when that big old boy who looked like he could whoop every professional wrestler that WWE ever had dropped to his knees and started crying and gave his heart to God. And that's when every devil in hell went. It still works. It doesn't matter if you kill somebody. It still works. Let's stand to your feet right now. I don't care how many mistakes you made. I don't care how bad it's been. I don't care how many kids you got. I don't care how many drugs you've went through. There's a God here today that can set you free. I know this is a simple sermon on baptism, but God's been dealing with me about this for two or three weeks. Somebody needs to hear it. You got to make that decision. You got to give your life to God. You got to get buried in that name. You need it. But there's an army behind you saying we won't let go. But I'm telling you, if you get to that water, they're going in with you, but they're not coming out with you. Woo! I'm going to pray. Why don't you come to the front? Let's seek God, Heavenly Father. I've said all I know to say. did all I know to do. I believe somebody needs to find a water grave. I believe we need to tell that.